joining us today as we have our second of our provost candidates. As I check with our folks in the back of the room to make sure we're streaming, we are indeed. Let me introduce to you Dr. Mark Clark. Good morning, everyone. And welcome to those who are on the other end of the live stream. Um, thank you for being here this morning. So, um, <clears throat> my name uh, is Mark Clark. Uh, hopefully, you've had an opportunity to take a look at my CV and materials uh, as part of my application to uh, serve as the next provost here at A State. Uh, what I'd like to do very quickly at the beginning of this presentation is to try to bring some of those experiences that uh, hopefully you've seen in my CV to life. Uh, and then spend most of the rest of the presentation uh, focused on the Discover 2025 uh, strategic plan <clears throat> and uh, some of my thoughts on that. So again, quickly uh, to give you some background, uh, I was born and raised in Northern Ireland. Uh, I'm a uh, first generation student and came from a small uh, rural uh, farming background. Um, my education uh, is an MA, MI biology in pharmacology at, from Manchester Metropolitan University. And I'm going to walk around if you don't mind. <laughs> and a PhD in cell biology and biochemistry, again, from Manchester Metropolitan University and also the Christie Hospital and Holt uh, Radium Institute. Can everybody hear? Uh, we good? <clears throat> um, I moved to the United States uh, in uh, 1991 uh, to do some postdoctoral training, both at Harvard Medical School and the Medical College of Georgia. And my research areas uh, for those of our faculty in the, in the uh, audience are tumor biology and some antibody directed uh, uh, drug targeting, angiogenesis, and skeletal muscle physiology. Uh, my career before joining U of H and uh, moving into the academy directly was uh, as a uh, National Research Council fellow at NASA Johnson Space Center. Uh, and, uh, specifically focused uh, for three years on some space flight induced muscle skeletal atrophy, and then moving across to a senior staff uh, scientist position, again in the Division of Life Sciences at NASA Johnson Space Center, where it became much more operationally related uh, with experiments on the sp space shuttle, ISS, uh, and a variety of uh, missions on the KC-135. Uh, which is hence why that picture is up there. I had the opportunity to fly 25 missions uh, on the KC-135, and that was a unique uh, set of experiences. Uh, my academic appointments uh, moved across to the University of Houston as a full-time faculty member in the, my home department, which is Health and Human Performance. I was the founding director of the Laboratory of Integrated Physiology, which is a multidisciplinary lab uh, that had, at the time, nine faculty members. Uh, I also serve and, and have held adjunct professor positions in pharmacology and toxicology, again at uh, MCG, Medical College of Georgia, and, and I served as an adjunct professor at Baylor. Uh, so I've always been involved, even while at NASA Johnson Space Center, with academic research. I've uh, once moved to U of H, I've served in multiple shared governance roles. Uh, as a faculty member, including uh, the standard departmental and college committees, uh, be they graduate research or uh, uh, chairing our P&T committee, uh, and then uh, served as faculty senate president uh, for a, uh, an extended uh, three-year period. Our model is a, an immediate uh, faculty, uh, excuse me, um, faculty senate president elect a year as the faculty center president and then a year as the past uh, president and all of those have uh, certain roles associated with them. As a faculty member, I, I love to talk about my research. In fact, at one of our uh, uh, events last night, I think I talked some people's ear off. I'm just going to quickly go through some of those uh, research interests for those that are interested. Uh, I've been very lucky to have been funded by NASA, DARPA, NIH, uh, NSF, and also through their uh, Innovation Corps, uh, um, which I'll talk about uh, in greater detail later, and also the U.S. Uh, Department of uh, Energy. And as you can see, I like pretty pictures. Uh, these are some uh, of the techniques and technologies that I have developed over the years, uh, and also publication uh, uh, images. 
So turning now to my administrative roles at U of H, uh, I began as the Associate Vice Chancellor and Vice President for Technology Transfer in the Division of Research and spent uh, just over three years in that position. Uh, I've also served and then moved across to the Office of the Provost uh, as Associate Provost for Faculty Development and Faculty Affairs. Uh, and that's the position I'm currently in. During that time, I had the opportunity to serve in a couple of interim roles. Uh, the first being the interim dean of our College of Technology, and that was really for about a six month period during a leadership transition. And then secondly, as interim vice provost for global engagement, uh, which started off as a temporary three month uh, cycle and ended up uh, being for two years. And part of that was uh, as part of an institutional reorganization of that office uh, into a new institute for global engagement, which took over uh, our, the previous uh, UH Global uh, Division. At the national level, I've been involved in a variety of different uh, national organizations uh, as a senior administrator and also as a faculty member. Uh, specifically, I've just stepped down as co-chair of the Commission on Economic and Community Engagement, also known as CC, uh, and that uh, is a year-long appointment. I also serve as the institutional representative to the Alliance of Hispanic Serving Research Universities, HRRU, uh, which is a new organization about two years old, and U of H was uh, one of the founding members of that as an R1 HSI. Um, <clears throat> I've served with uh, CC on the previous commission called CICEP, and I do apologize for the word scrambled of letters, uh, but that commission, it is uh, the Association of Public Land Grant Universities, a state is a member of that association, uh, and I've served on their executive committee for uh, close to a decade. I'm also a fellow of the National Academy of Inventors and also a senior member, uh, one of the uh, limited number that actually carry both of those uh, designations. So I'd like to uh, quickly go through my current responsibilities as Associate Provost uh, for Faculty Development and uh, Faculty Affairs. Uh, I've listed here uh, my direct reports. These are uh, offices within the Office of the Provost Umbrella and then also those shared governance groups that I uh, have oversight uh, um, with. And the major responsibilities, as you might expect, are faculty recruitment and retention, faculty professional development, uh, those programs associated with faculty research preeminence and the uh, preeminence of the institution, student success initiatives, which I will say when I began in this role, were primarily at the interface between faculty and students. Uh, and uh, uh, with the advent of some uh, crises uh, in Houston, including hurricanes, floods, winter storms, and of course COVID, which has uh, impacted everybody. Uh, I became much more involved in student success initiatives uh, and managing that as we went through those uh, uh, some challenging times. I'm also uh, uh, responsible for academic innovation, all academic policies, especially those that are related to faculty uh, and the interface between faculty and students academic space, and then of course that uh, interesting last bullet, which is the one that everybody looks at and goes, yeah, I exactly know what that is, duties as assigned. Uh, so it is a catch-all, uh, and I do serve as the deputy to the provost uh, and the uh, um, designee uh, when the provost is not on campus. Uh, as part of being uh, interim vice provost for global engagement, uh, that began three months before COVID and then ran through COVID and then uh, the year afterwards. Uh, one of the interesting things uh, at uh, U of H for U, uh, the UH Global Office, as it was then called, now called the Institute for uh, Global Engagement, is we have our own US passport office on campus. Uh, that was set up primarily associated with learning abroad for our students, uh, but is also open to all faculty and staff uh, and members of the community to come on uh, campus and uh, have a U.S. passport issued. Uh, and also, uh, the, the roles and responsibilities uh, of that interim position included travel abroad protocols, which became very important during the COVID uh, limited uh, access to the rest of the world. Uh, we also have uh, uh, developed a global citizen's credential, which makes um, or uh, leverages uh, classes that undergraduate students take uh, that have defined uh, 
uh, international uh, knowledge base and engagement as part of the curriculum so that they can uh, essentially uh, accrue a global citizen credential that they then appears on their transcript uh, if they complete the requirements. Uh, we also have a Peace Corps program uh, at U of H, uh, which is very, uh, uh, I would say, maybe 10 to 15 students a year, but uh, our new director, is, uh, who's a uh, retired U.S. ambassador, uh, is pushing that particular uh, experience for students uh, as part of the international and global engagement for our student body. And of course, this office was also responsible for all foreign institution MOUs and articulation agreements. <clears throat> um, going back to uh, one of my first uh, um, administrative roles, uh, this was the associate VC and VP for technology transfer. The VC is there because that office is actually system-wide. We have four universities within the UH system, uh, the VP being uh, on, the, on the flagship, and, and to be honest, that's where 90-95% uh, of our IP and technology transfer uh, and uh, innovation comes from within the UH system. Uh, my uh, direct reports and governance oversight uh, included our UH Innovation Center and UH Laboratory Incubator Facility, uh, which we built uh, uh, during my time as, as uh, technology transfer uh, czar at U of H uh, in what's now called the UH Technology Bridge. At the time, it was the UH Energy Research Park. Um, we, as part of that role, it was to try and build a, uh, an integrated and network system uh, with the larger uh, Greater Houston and Regional Innovation and Entrepreneurial uh, Ecosystems. Uh, and we had a lot of partners uh, in that uh, externally, such as the Texas Medical Center Innovation uh, Group, uh, NSF, which funded a project for me to create an NSF iCourse site at U of H. And a lot of that was facilitated by our academic colleges and especially our Wolf Center for Entrepreneurship, which is uh, one of the leading undergraduate entrepreneurship programs in the nation. So with that, hopefully I've, I've brought uh, my CV to life in terms of uh, um, other than just lots of uh, text on a paper. Uh, but now I'd like to turn to the more important part of this presentation. Uh, which is focusing on the Discover 2025 strategic plan at A-State uh, and also um, um, providing some uh, of my thoughts on that and uh, a little bit of data along the way uh, and then some potential suggestions. Now, oops, there we go. So there are, as you all know, uh, I've uh, been impressed by uh, the Discover 2025 sort of visibility uh, certainly in your out outward facing uh, communications and then also even embedded within uh, those colleges that already have strategic plans uh, and they're all linked back to Discover 2025 so there's very cohesive messaging around Discover 2025 and I think that's an excellent reflection uh, of a process that uh, appears to have had broad uh, based uh, um, stakeholder engagement and input in order to create that Discover 2025 strategic plan. Uh, <clears throat> and that is something that I've had uh, significant experience, uh, especially in the last couple of years. We've just gone into our new strategic plan, uh, and that took, uh, it began before COVID. It was a little bit of a pause, I'm sure, uh, as here at A-State, uh, but then got finalized uh, once we got back on campus. So first, I'd like to specifically talk about the student success goal, uh, and I'm sure you all know, I'm not going to read that through, uh, but it is a commitment to student success, uh, and I take it as your, uh, the first goal, it is the highest priority, uh, and a priority that by definition uh, drives all of the rest of the plan. <clears throat> now, as we go through this, uh, I've uh, had an opportunity to talk to lots of stakeholders over the last day and a half. Uh, and what I've learned is that some of the things I'm going to talk about uh, are actually already ongoing here at U of H, and it's uh, part of, uh, I would say, a coherent plan to address these issues. Uh, but in terms of uh, um, providing an example of how I would look at these elements, 
Uh, I want to start by saying everything from my perspective needs to be data-driven and evidence-based when it comes to decision-making. Uh, so when it comes to looking at enrollments, looking at SCH generation, looking at uh, graduation rates, it all needs to be, uh, again, data, data-based and evidence, or excuse me, data-driven and evidence-based. And here are some of the sort of general things that I saw looking at your data, uh, both of your iPads data uh, in the national database and also your fact book. Um, as you might um, uh, expect, and I, I, I've ha I have heard this, uh, especially last, uh, yesterday, talking to multiple, pa multiple stakeholders, that we need to increase student enrollment here at A State. And that uh, potentially is actually a reflection more of the national trends than necessarily just here at A State. Although, uh, as we go through uh, this, this uh, overview of the goal one, student success, uh, a goal for the Discover 2025. I think there are some unique aspects to it that are probably internal to a state. And I say that because some of the patterns that I've identified, or I think I've identified, uh, are actually things that we've dealt with and are dealing with at U of H when it comes to student enrollment. Uh, <clears throat> such as the, uh, increasing the number of admitted students. Uh, the, when we think about the recruitment funnel, uh, from students that actually apply, uh, uh, admitting students that are academically qualified for the programs, uh, and then ultimately enrolling them. Uh, as you'll see, I'll, I'll show a little bit of data <clears throat> that there does appear to be a, uh, not necessarily a disconnect, but a, um, the expectation would be that you would have more uh, enrolled students based on the number of students that you actually admitted. And ensuring, in general, timely progress towards degree completion. This goes directly to graduation rates, both four and six year graduation rates. And then potentially the uh, uh, increasing your retention rate. Uh, and this requires uh, ensuring optimal course availability and course sequencing uh, in order to have timely degree towards, or timely progression towards degree and graduation. And then there were a couple of uh, academic gaps that I saw in your data, and I think you're probably all aware of those. Uh, so let's, uh, let's take a look at it. As, as I say, I'm data-driven, evidence-based. This is data that's uh, embedded in iPads and also in your uh, uh, fact book. Uh, we see a trend uh, in overall headcount uh, that's been going on since back in 2017. Uh, the most recent data that I was able to get publicly is the fall 2021. Uh, I did see some fall 2022 data, which I'll uh, reflect on. Uh, again, the issue in, is, has been the undergraduate headcount is, is going down uh, as a trend. Uh, your graduate headcount has been going up, uh, which is a positive thing. But overall, uh, the uh, increase in graduate enrollment has not been able to <clears throat> increase the, um, or uh, overcome the overall decrement. So you're running about 7% uh, uh, decrement over the last five years. Uh, we st it appears that this is in full-time students here at, at A-State. Uh, in fact, your part-times have actually been going up uh, over that five-year period. Uh, but a 20% drop in uh, full-time enrollment headcount uh, is a significant drop. And I think this is a reflection, as I'm sure everybody in the audience is aware, uh, of the so-called demographic cliff. Uh, this appears to be in uh, undergraduate and potentially freshmen. In fact, some of the data that I'll show uh, in a moment will uh, uh, support that. Uh, and this is because we're looking at a shrinking pool of freshmen uh, or potential freshmen uh, here at A-State. Uh, and that is not unusual. Uh, one thing in Texas is we have yet to f actually see that. Uh, there is a prediction that it's going to be five to seven years uh, in Texas and a couple of other states. Uh, but we certainly do see it on the East Coast and, uh, and in the Midwest. So in that respect, I don't think a state is any different than a, a lot of other uh, institutions when it comes to the, uh, uh, their enrollment trends. <clears throat> this is the uh, uh, fall 2021 student recruitment data. And I think uh, in some ways is telling uh, and potentially sort of identifies some uh, areas around strategic enrollment. Uh, and I know we have a strategic enrollment plan. I have not yet seen 
uh, that in any detail. Uh, again, uh, for those that are, are involved in that, I'm sure you guys have plans to address this. But certainly from my perspective, looking at that uh, data set, uh, you can see here in-state, out-of-state, and international recruitment. Uh, it is encouraging that uh, we have a significant number of students that have applied, both as freshmen, transfers, and graduate students. Uh, and that a lot of those students are academically qualified to attend a state, i.e. the in admitted students. What to me says that there's some disconnect uh, in this funnel uh, is that uh, only 38% of your freshmen that are admitted, uh, i.e. academically uh, qualified to be here at, at a state, uh, which is this yield ratio, where the yield ratio is enrolled to admitted students. Uh, is actually much lower than we might want to see. Uh, and one of the questions that I uh, would, would uh, sort of pose to the group is, why is that? Uh, again, the same with out-of-state students. Uh, there are, uh, we, you continue to have uh, quite a few students actually apl uh, applying to the university. There are less necessarily uh, qualified, academically qualified students, but again, the yield rate from those that have already been admitted to a state uh, is actually quite low, again, in the freshmen. Freshmen is where the, this problem seems to have its greatest sort of nexus. Uh, there are some, some uh, from my perspective, uh, looking at it and, and uh, sort of comparing to UH uh, enrollment, uh, strategic enrollment strategies. There's some bright spots, which are that uh, admitted students for transfers and graduates in state. It's actually a very positive yield rate. Uh, the same with graduates out of state. And certainly your international recruitment numbers actually look pretty good, especially after two or three years of the uh, global issues with uh, COVID and limited mobility. So some explicit elements of the Discover 2025 plan uh, and targets that have been set as part of the Discover 2025 plan. Um, I suspect that uh, because of, of COVID and that sort of pause, uh, it may not necessarily be a target for 2025, uh, but I think they are achievable in, uh, towards 2025. Uh, there's a, a wish to increase your four-year uh, and your six-year graduations uh, f uh, to targets of 45% for four years and 65% for the six-year graduation. A six-year graduation, if the target was 2025 to hit that number, uh, that's a plus 17 delta. Uh, that's a, an aggressive and uh, uh, um, change to bring about, but uh, what I can say is some of the things I'll talk about as we go, pa go past the data uh, and the approaches that we've used at U of H, uh, we were able to uh, uh, make that type of shift in a relatively short period of time. Uh, so <clears throat> depending on, on the interventions that uh, end up getting uh, uh, in place. Uh, another goal is to get your retention rate up, your one-year retention rate. That's that first-year retention rate. Again, this is for FTIC students, first-time in college students. Uh, from 2022, which is 79%, I, I have not been able to access uh, the 2022 data. Uh, I would be interested to see what the retention rate is uh, and the target for 2025 within the Discover uh, 2025 strategic plan. Uh, being 85%. So how, might, how uh, uh, might we get there? And uh, again, I'll, I, I want to preface my comments by saying that as I've been here on, here on campus and talked to, to various stakeholders, I've realized that there are quite a few of these approaches uh, that are being either have been in place or are in the process of being put in place. Uh, and a lot of the things associated with uh, enrollment are lagging indicators. Uh, so again, it will be over the next couple of years that we would see the impact of those programs. Uh, but what I'd like to do is sort of uh, uh, go through some of the things that we've uh, uh, deployed at U of H over the last five to 10 years uh, when it comes to student success 
And student success is not just increasing our enrollment, but it's also about degree progression, the number of students who graduate uh, in a timely fashion, uh, and do so in the most efficient way with the least number of hours possible. Uh, while satisfying the academic curriculum, the needs of the academic curriculum. So targeted recruitment strategies, what do I mean by that? And again, I was unaware that we actually have a strategic uh, enrollment uh, strategy. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how much that has been implemented, but I would be happy to uh, and interested to see. Uh, but those targeted recruitment strategies are based on where's the market. Uh, and I think looking at the uh, uh, enrollment data in the previous slide, uh, there is some opportunities uh, in the in-state market and certainly some uh, in the international market and then uh, um, uh, incremental uh, potential positive uh, yields uh, in the out-of-state or transfer unit. But again, I think the focus needs to be around freshmen because that's where the biggest hole and the biggest gap is. Um, one of the, the challenges that we've faced at U of H over, especially over the last five years, is this issue of uh, uh, admitted students. Our yields were as low as 15 to 20 percent in some programs uh, associated with students that are admitted, they're academically qualified. Um, did they come to orientation? Because there's another part of that funnel all the way down through orientation and enrollment and the student actually turning up in your classes. Uh, but uh, I think there are some opportunities to increase the yield rate uh, of the number of admitted students uh, across all of the different career paths. Um, the first, uh, we implemented a first year experience for students uh, that involves uh, such things as appreciative advising. Uh, that's a, a framework for academic advising that builds trusted relationships uh, between students, uh, their peers, and their faculty. Uh, there's a, a byword of the six D's, disarm, uh, discover, dream, design, deliver, and don't settle for uh, something that's not associated with what the student needs or what the faculty needs. Um, <clears throat> that also uh, uh, is sort of central to uh, some of the tools that we have uh, deployed. I just heard this morning that we, we do uh, are part of EAB. Uh, I think that's a wonderful organization and has, has driven quite a few uh, elements at U of H in terms of providing uh, peer support and uh, uh, best practices uh, and um, uh, peer working groups across multiple institutions uh, within a very clear framework of what we're trying to achieve. Uh, one of the tools that we use that comes from AAB is Navigate. I think there's a... a I think I heard Starfish is the sort of equivalent that's used here, uh, but that essentially is a system of early alert uh, for academic performance for students uh, where students are sort of categorized as high, low, as high medium or low risk uh, relative to their academic progression. And that's something that we've been using at U of H for four or five years. It has some very useful communication tools that are direct reach out and personalize to students. Um, our guided academic pathways to student success, I think that is one of the, uh, I would say, um, uh, game changers at U, uh, at U of H and also for the greater Houston area uh, and specifically uh, as part of the uh, complete College America framework uh, and what are called game changers. Uh, our previous provost, Paula Short, actually developed something called Houston GPS. Uh, this is a consortium of uh, local four-year universities and two-year community colleges. I believe we're up to 12 of those, including all of the U of H systems, uh, TSU, Texas Southern University, uh, and uh, uh, at least five of the largest uh, community colleges in the greater Houston area. Uh, and that provides a, essentially a uniform system uh, for students for transfer pathways, uh, internal academic maps, academic maps that connect between the different institutions, and all of those institutions are formally committed uh, to providing seamless pathways uh, for students uh, towards degree completion in as little a time as possible uh, while satisfying the state and the academic requirements of the programs that they're in. An offshoot of Houston GPS uh, was a, uh, a, uh, specifically for UH on the, on the uh, 
um, on the uh, main campus, our flagship campus, uh, is UH in four. Uh, that is a guided pathways cohort program that's, that uh, is based on the framework within Houston GPS, but it also comes with a financial incentive uh, where students, if they guaranteed or 15 or more hours, uh, are guaranteed a fixed price over their four years. And it's all about four-year graduation. Uh, it also helps us with our six-year graduation, but uh, it is programmed specifically around uh, increasing our four-year graduation rate. Uh, that has been a very successful program. I believe more than 85% of all of our freshmen coming into U of H not, are now in UH in four. Um, this sort of, uh, let's say, uh, moves into uh, the last two bullets. If you start to cohort students uh, and say that uh, we guarantee that your courses will be available so that you can graduate in four years, you have to start to think about how you schedule classes, where the faculty resources are coming from, uh, the sequencing of those cores. Um, <clears throat> that becomes something that you can't do anymore on the sticky pad or in an Excel spreadsheet. I, I can tell you that from personal experience. Um, and you also need to have a, a particular uh, approach to teaching and learning from faculty uh, in order to be able to provide those classes in that sequenced way uh, and in a way that, that uh, students can, in fact, take at least 15 hours uh, in order to graduate within four years. So one of the things uh, that we've focused on uh, through uh, one of my offices, which is uh, the Office of Faculty Engagement and Development, which I'll talk about in much more detail in a moment as part of the teaching and learning goal, uh, is focused on uh, faculty instructional training and the resources that faculty need in order to uh, actually deliver those curriculums. And I know that we have a Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning here at A-State. Uh, the functions of the center, uh, this, uh, uh, your center, are actually embedded within uh, the FED, which is the, uh, the acronym being uh, Faculty Engagement and Development, where that is one of three pillars uh, in the FED. Uh, and those functions associated with uh, uh, let's say effective teaching practices in the classroom and uh, uh, equitable teaching practices uh, are delivered to our, our uh, and made available to our faculty uh, through our FED, uh, which as I say has two other pillars, uh, one being uh, supporting faculty uh, research and scholarship uh, towards research preeminence for the institution, and then also another pillar associated with faculty mentoring. And again, I'll, I'll talk about that in a little more detail in a moment. But the, uh, uh, one of the things that I was, I was happy to see here at A-State is that you have full engagement with ACU. Uh, currently, I'm a PI, I'm the institutional PI for a large grant uh, between ACU funded by the Gates Foundation. Uh, and this involves, uh, I believe, five or six uh, institutions. Um, uh, we are the only R1 in that particular group. Uh, the others being regional and some R2s. And the, the sort of research question there is, does uh, completion of the ACU uh, certificate uh, uh, for um, um, effective college teaching, which is a 25-week online course uh, that is facilitated. I know, I believe there have been two cohorts here uh, at A-State of 33. Uh, we actually ran three cohorts as part of this study. Uh, and those, uh, in, our, in the particular de uh, experimental design for the study, it is only in gateway courses. So those are essentially your core undergraduate classes. Uh, so we have 99 instructors that teach uh, in the core across all disciplines. Uh, this was a, uh, uh, um, we recruited uh, from those group of instructors. Uh, so 99 that have gone through that 25, I think actually 77 of them completed uh, and got their certificate. Uh, the other ones, uh, um, you know, <clears throat> they have to complete on a particular day. If they haven't completed their modules, they don't get the certificate. But they do uh, uh, pick up micro-credentials along the way in particular elements. Uh, and we're uh, looking forward to being able to crack our data, uh, which are, is the academic achievement of, of students that have actually been taught classes over the last year 
by ACU certified instructors, faculty instructors. And then of course we have our comparison group which are instructors teaching the same core classes that uh, for the vast uh, majority of those core classes uh, they have set curriculum uh, that is common across multiple sections. So it's a, an interesting and, and I think will be a very useful experimental design in order to uh, understand the impact of let's say modulating how the, how the faculty member teaches. So that's the intervention uh, is a ACU uh, certified instructor versus not. Uh, and we'll begin that process of cracking the data uh, in terms of student um, academic achievement data uh, such as uh, GPAs, retention rates, uh, DWIFI rates for example for those, for those classes uh, within the next couple of months. And then finally, again, going back to this concept of once you start to cohort students, for example, in UH and 4, and especially your FITCs that drive uh, the national ranking numbers associated with four and six year graduations, uh, you need to start to manage your scheduling and uh, course sequencing uh, uh, process uh, in, a, in a more complicated or a complex manner. Uh, and we've uh, enge had engagement with Ad Astra. Uh, this is a, uh, I'm not sure whether you guys use Ad Astra. Uh, this started off as a um, classroom scheduling tool uh, and they've now expanded out into uh, not only uh, sort of a, a academic space management or a classroom management, but also into some predictive analytics associated with uh, student demand for particular classes. And the tool that they uh, we've helped actually develop as a, as a uh, primary partner with Ad Astra uh, uh, all the way to a little pet project of mine which is to create a digital twin for enrollment uh, and uh, uh, faculty resources associated with that so that you can test out uh, some different structures and sequencing uh, of courses uh, relative to predicted uh, uh, demand for those courses versus historical data. Uh, without actually having to change what's happening in your, in your schedule right now because those of you that are involved in scheduling, it is a one year uh, out activity uh, and you can't change in real time. Uh, so the concept of a digital twin to test out different variab uh, uh, variable or, or approaches to uh, course scheduling and uh, uh, um, uh, even classroom allocation within time bonds, all of those things uh, means that you can play in a virtual space where you don't actually do any damage uh, to the real numbers which are your graduation rates and uh, 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 progress towards degree completion. One of the, uh, uh, the advantages of having those types of uh, evidence-based data-driven systems for course scheduling is that you can also then start to take a look at faculty uh, resources relative to how many instructors you need, how much it's going to cost, uh, and look at it from a business case model. Uh, so with that one, I'd like to move, uh, move on to the second goal of the Discover 2025, uh, which is around teaching and learning. And with regard to that, I think we need to start out with the sort of first uh, um, statement up um, on those bullet points, uh, which is our uh, degree programs and academic programs by definition have to be affordable, state of the art, uh, and relevant to the real world. Uh, I'm sure that all of you have been following the sort of uh, the dip in the perception of higher ed as a value added uh, relative to uh, uh, a person's life and career. Uh, with, uh, the U.S. public appears to be losing confidence in that uh, and it, it doesn't necessarily directly translate. Uh, you can show the, uh, the impact of an uh, uh, undergraduate degree on lifetime earnings every day, every week and we still have a problem convincing people that it's better to go to college uh, <clears throat> than decide to, to end their education at the high school level. You know, with the advance uh, or the advent of um, micro credentials and stackable uh, credential, uh, excuse me, stackable uh, certificates uh, at the community college level, all of those are great things. They're pathways towards an undergraduate degree. Uh, but in the end, those undergraduate degrees and graduate degrees that we offer, certainly as a publicly funded 
uh, institution. I personally and firmly believe that they have to be affordable uh, and relevant to the real world. So how do you get there in some of those ways? Uh, in terms of we need to prepare students for lifelong success, and that's across a career that may change multiple times. Uh, I know uh, uh, from my own personal experience, the skill set that I learned in graduate school, well, it's, it's stone age compared to what, we, what we're teaching in graduate school now, certainly on the technical side. So those things have to be about continual process of learning and upskilling the individual, even though they have a, a base degree. Um, so these career spanning skills, this is a term that we developed as part of some work with, with CC uh, and some position papers. Uh, career spanning skills are those skills that trans, essentially translate and transfer between different jobs throughout your career. Uh, and they go beyond those that are normally considered with, a, uh, uh, with an undergraduate degree, you know, the sort of classic uh, um, uh, attributes of, of um, um, communication skills, uh, uh, critical thinking, STEM, and uh, uh, STEM literacy, uh, uh, into things that are required uh, in the modern workforce, which are uh, problem identification, and problem solving, and more importantly, being able to do that uh, in, uh, uh, in teams. It's a team-based sport now in terms of uh, addressing issues in the workforce. Uh, and they have to be able to do that in a diverse uh, team, both culturally and, and physically diverse, uh, in that the world is, is changing. Uh, and in order to prepare our students for that lifelong success, they need those career-spanning skills. And how do you actually get those career spanning skills, and I'm sure many of you in this audience would agree with this, uh, and I know that it is part of uh, a stated goal of the Discover 2025, uh, is that you need to provide that through experiential learning, and specifically real world, uh, um, <coughs> excuse me, real world experience learning, uh, experiential learning opportunities that by definition must be pedagogically signed. Uh, I know from spending some time on the faculty side of the house and listening to my faculty now that I represent them through academic affairs and the office of the provost is that that's what their worry is, is that in some way involving these uh, experiential learning opportunities waters down the academic uh, uh, aspect of that. And that's not true. Faculty are still going to be responsible for the quality of that curriculum. The key is to think about that curriculum through this experiential learning opportunity and how it actually impacts the student success once they graduate from their class or matriculate from their class. Uh, so again, <clears throat> I think it's more a perception and a lens through which to view the academic curriculum. Uh, and uh, again, I, I strongly believe and have seen this uh, in person, when you provide that type of opportunity to students, uh, they mature and they evolve very rapidly and they become successful very quickly. Uh, and where the, I would say my most uh, um, uh, eye-opening moment was uh, around the UH uh, NSF i -Corps site, uh, which was a uh, NSF funded research uh, pr um, grant that was focused specifically on the uh, uh, educating the next generation of innovators and entrepreneurs who came from a STEM background. So STEM uh, background students, not necessarily having much business acumen or an understanding of how uh, innovation and entrepreneurship works. Uh, we team them up with entrepreneurial students uh, into E-teams. And as you track those students over a six or an eight week boot camp, basically as E-teams, uh, you see those students learn skills that that you wouldn't normally see, like being able to stand up in front of uh, some heavy hitter shark tank style uh, investors with real money and pitch to those. Uh, and uh, I'm, not, I'm not a business faculty member, but I've heard this many times is, you know, is it uh, fake it until you make it? Uh, these students uh, learn multiple skill sets uh, across these types of career spanning skills also known, I'm sure, as uh, you've heard the term soft skills along the way. But in order to do uh, that, uh, it does require a thoughtful and an intentional approach. 
Uh, one of the things that we've deployed at U of H over the last five years as part of our SACS uh, COC um, uh, quality improvement plan is the site program, which is the co-curricular uh, uh, initiative to engage or Cougar initiative to engage. And this is all focused on including co-curricular activities uh, in uh, the curriculum. Uh, that particular program uh, is centrally funded because it's part of our requirement uh, for SACS uh, accreditation. Uh, and we provide seed funding for faculty members to explore and develop and actually deliver uh, new curriculum uh, in their programs that by definition has a co-curricular activity. And that can be many things. It can be service learning. Uh, it can be community engagement. Uh, it can be innovation. Uh, but again, it's all about experiential learning embedded in the classroom. Uh, and we announced uh, less than two weeks ago that all of our uh, undergraduate classes uh, within the next two to three years will all have some type of internship or co-curricular activity that can be tagged as an experiential learning component. So I think, I think that has, uh, certainly at U of H has gained a lot of traction. Our faculty are very much uh, 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 in favor of these. Uh, and again, it's all about how we've, uh, I say, engaged with our faculty in order to create those in that these are things that we're going to help our faculty to do, but it is the expectation that every undergraduate course or every undergraduate class uh, will have one of these experiences. Um, <clears throat> one of the other things that I think is uh, uh, we've learned um, uh, associated with COVID is that there are students, especially lifelong uh, learners and working professionals, that it's hard for them to, to attend university, certainly an undergraduate uh, experience, uh, you know, the nine to five uh, approach. Uh, and we've uh, begun uh, and, and actively and in quite a large way uh, increased our uh, multimodal instructional capacity at U of H. And when I say multimodal, essentially it's what we're doing today. Uh, it's a face-to-face -face class with students on campus and then the ability to sign up for a section that is essentially a synchronous uh, class uh, along the way. Uh, and we've just deployed 15 new classrooms uh, that uh, the technology uh, package that was developed was developed with the help of about 140 faculty members who taught our high flex classes during COVID, who let us know very quickly that the technology support uh, in order to do that effectively in the way that they wanted to deliver their uh, curriculum did not work with a webcam, a, 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 a pic mic, uh, and a computer at the podium. That just doesn't work. <clears throat> so our uh, technology load was basically what, what is it that you need in order to do this effectively and that you would be excited to, to, to teach in this new environment. Uh, and what came out of that, uh, in the end, we used our federal money to, to equip 50 classrooms, general purpose classrooms, uh, with some high-end uh, AV equipment, including tracking cameras, uh, monitors all the way around the, the, the auditoriums, uh, high-end audio-visual and specifically audio so that there's a, uh, a real-time communication not only with the students sitting out in the audience but also at home. Uh, and we have just begun the process of, of uh, uh, deploying those in terms of uh, multimodal uh, classes for the fall semester, the upcoming fall semester. Uh, again, that's at the beginning of that process, but we now have the capacity for faculty members uh, to explore those options as we go along. And that also fits in with uh, UH Extend, which is the equivalent of uh, AOS, uh, uh, A-State Online uh, uh, Curriculum. And then finally, when it comes to this overall uh, experiential learning, I think one of the parts that we miss along the way is that in order for this to work, you really do need to actively engage with industry and community partners to co-create, and that's a very specific term that I'm gonna use later on when it comes to community engagement, um, to co-create innovative curriculums that include those experiential learning opportunities for students. Uh, and uh, as I say, we've just uh, announced that all of our undergraduate classes will have one of these. Uh, within two to three years. That's a pretty heavy lift. 
uh, with the number of uh, undergraduate classes we actually deliver. Uh, but we do have the infrastructure and the support of the faculty and the interest of the faculty already in place to be able to do that. And that includes paid internships. Our goal is that everybody gets a paid internship. Uh, that is a, a very aggressive and a uh, bit of a stretch goal, uh, even in greater Houston area, which has a lot of industry partners. But that's the goal, and that's uh, you know, going back for don't settle uh, in terms of... Uh, reach for the stars and hit the moon. Okay, so around research and creative activities, um, what I've heard over the last day or so is that uh, uh, being an R2, A state uh, recognizes the, the importance and role of, of research and creative activities uh, from our faculty to, to drive that and to increase opportunities for both our faculty and, and uh, students. Um, I think there's been, I've had some comments from, from various stakeholders uh, that that transition from primarily a teaching institution to an R2 institution it was put on pause for COVID. I fully understand that. Um, but that there's an appetite for, for engaging with that and getting on with it. But with that, you know, where are we now in terms of, and again, this is data that I was able to, to garner from your fact books and, and uh, public available. It may not be, some of these may not be correct, uh, and I'm sh I'd be happy to uh, um, hear from the audience if they aren't. Uh, but it's certainly uh, an NSF annual research expenditures. The most re recent data that I was able to, to access is 25.5 million. The target for Discover uh, 2025 is 30.6, which is an increase of 20%. Um, this is not necessarily a unattainable goal. In fact, if anything, uh, with what I've seen uh, already with uh, the types of research that are here on campus, uh, A State looks very much like U of H was when I joined as a faculty member 20 years ago. Uh, you have some very interesting pre-existing uh, uh, research intensive and uh, uh, opportunities and structures that are already here, including the Arkansas Biosciences Institute, which I've heard a little bit about, but not uh, as much as I would like to. I was very interested to see your new center for no boundaries thinking. AI is one of those areas that is going to impact higher ed in ways that we can't even imagine today. Uh, but uh, I did hear uh, using it as adaptive technology. I'm bringing that idea back to our communication sciences uh, division in that I thought that was a very unique way to think about how you can use AI uh, and it comes from the ability of faculty members to uh, have access and some uh, help understanding what these things are capable of. So again, uh, faculty members helping faculty members through such a center as MBT uh, is a good thing. Uh, <clears throat> I know that we, uh, last week, uh, my office had sent out a request uh, for um, proposals associated with faculty members deploying uh, AI chatbots uh, in their classrooms uh, in order to try and get a handle on what these things can do and what these things probably shouldn't do uh, when it comes to higher ed. Uh, and the only way to, to figure that out is to actually go test it. Right? I'm, a, I'm an em empirical scientist by, uh, uh, by training and by uh, uh, disposition uh, and having our faculty members actually test the boundaries uh, and see whether they can come up with ways to appropriately control the use of that uh, within the academic curriculum before it gets rolled out, uh, I think is a good thing. So we're trying to be ahead of that. I think you guys are actually much further along uh, with the MBT. I haven't heard uh, specifically, uh, and be happy to have a conversation about that. Uh, <clears throat> but I do think that AI is going to change the very nature of, of higher ed. Um, also, the Delta Center for Economic Development. Uh, this is something I've heard about. I haven't had an opportunity to, to uh, speak to those individuals uh, that are um, central to the operations. But again, that's a, a good, uh, from my perspective, example of innovation, entrepreneurship, and actually community engagement uh, through that uh, A-State's Delta Center. Um, I also read uh, out there that uh, you had a recent discussion and movement towards a P20 Educational Innovation Center. I think that's a very positive element. This goes back in some ways to 
this uh, guided academic pathways uh, framework that uh, uh, basically comes from uh, Complete College America uh, and requires uh, in interinstitutional networks and collaborations in order to actually work. Um, <clears throat> some of the other uh, uh, targets uh, as part of the Discover 2025 are increasing the master's degrees awarded uh, by 25% uh, and also the number of doctoral degrees awarded from 88 to 176. And what I see in some of these targets is potentially a, a wish to move towards tier one. Uh, I mean, that's not a five-year goal. Uh, to be honest, you can achieve it uh, if you leverage uh, what's out there. U of H's uh, experience was, in fact, that we had a target of five to six years for tier one uh, when we realized that uh, we had capacity to increase our research expenditures and specifically, uh, let's say, uh, research grant proposals with a sp specific group of faculty members leveraging uh, pre-existing centers, for example, uh, we made it in three years. So it's not undoable and it's not an unrealistic goal, uh, but um, I think that needs to be a, a, an explicit if, in fact, that's uh, something that A-State wants to do. So now I'd like to spend just a little time on <clears throat> uh, how we support those activities for students, excuse me, for faculty members specifically. Uh, and rather than, for example, having a center for teaching and learning uh, or uh, excellence center, uh, we actually have this UOH Office of Faculty Engagement and Development. So this is something I created uh, nearly eight years ago, um, and it has steadily progressed and expanded uh, over, the, over the last five to six years. Uh, you can see there are a lot of things that are covered uh, within the three pillars uh, that the Fed focuses on. I encourage you to go on the web and take a look at all of this. this. All of the information that's up here, you can actually directly access on the UH uh, website. Um, but <clears throat> we were able to uh, create some space with the help of administration and finance at U of H, which we call the Faculty Cafe. That is actually a, a collision space. It was modeled on the innovation center that I built uh, at the uh, UH Technology Bridge uh, for uh, innovation related activities uh, but the faculty cafe space the innovation uh, excuse me collision space for faculty members uh, it has a high-end coffee service the best coffee on campus uh, and faculty members are the ones that can swipe in to get that uh, so there is a, a little bit of an incentive to get to that space but it's a it's a quiet space at times uh, we also have some executive offices or executive office suites, there are five booths that we uh, make available to our emeritus faculty to come back on campus and spend some time with us uh, within the Fed. It's also open to faculty members who want a quiet space to do some writing. Uh, and in fact, that's one of our signature programs, which is uh, uh, around, uh, we call it the fact writing program, uh, which is essentially a, a um, a three-tier uh, writing program for faculty members that focuses uh, on developing, uh, using uh, evidence-based approaches, uh, a writing practice, uh, and uh, uh, a, a schedule for writing that's supported by their peers. Uh, and uh, the level of engagement the faculty member can, can pick from, uh, they can either do it as a self-paced uh, along with uh, a group do it virtually uh, in Teams. We use Teams as our, rather than Zoom, uh, we use Teams as our virtual meeting space on campus. Uh, or they can do it face-to-face -face over a cup of coffee uh, in the faculty cafe. Um, part of uh, one of the things that we, we, we try to do with faculty in the same way we've been trying to do with, with students is that once we hire a faculty member, uh, and just to give you a sort of a feel, we normally have something like 50, uh, in the last few years, they've all been replacement lines for tenure, tenure track faculty. At least 50 uh, of our promotion eligible non-tenure track faculty members, those are, they have academic rank and go through a probationary period. Uh, um, and then uh, our full-time lecturers and instructors, not instructors, uh, lecturers, excuse me. Um, and they go through a new faculty orientation process that begins uh, in the June of the year that they're going to, to, to join, uh, essentially, the academic year, September 1. 
Uh, they all, the Fed manages that interaction and communication. And our goal is to make sure that our new faculty members feel that they belong to U of H way before they get on campus and that they are um, in some ways indoctrinated uh, with the UH culture uh, before they start teaching their classes or get into their labs uh, in their first semester. Uh, that includes personalized multi-level checklists for the unfortunately 12 different administrative steps a faculty member actually has to complete before they are ready to go in a classroom. IT, uh, badges, um, parking, uh, I-9, employment, HR elements. One thing that is different uh, at U of H is compared to a state, uh, faculty HR resides in my faculty affairs office. We do everything other than health care and retirement benefits for faculty members. Uh, so their, their, their uh, compensation, uh, their HR uh, and employment all go through faculty affairs. So that's, uh, I think, a different model than here at A-State. Uh, and that's in some ways very useful, excuse me, uh, very useful in terms of managing the faculty life cycle because it's actually directly under the control of our, of our faculty affairs. Uh, we have professional development for department chairs. I heard that last uh, yesterday when I talked to the, your council of chairs. Uh, this, these are uh, either uh, in specific departments or across colleges usually uh, because the cultures of different uh, colleges, they are different. Uh, and sometimes there's a need for a sort of a more common approach between department chairs, but we also uh, have specific personalized uh, types of, of uh, programming for department chairs around things like conflict resolution, dealing with uh, uh, difficult employees, uh, all of the things that you might expect in terms of professional development for department chairs except that they are, uh, in fact, we ended up having to either modify or create our own uh, programming around uh, professional development for department chairs because when we reached out and tried to use some of the standard sort of HR or management tools, it really didn't translate to the faculty world. Uh, so uh, a lot of the things that you see up here have been programming that have been developed for faculty by faculty. Uh, we have a, a Fed Faculty Advisory Board, uh, which actually has, in some ways, the control of what the Fed does. Uh, they run a needs survey with our faculty every year to determine what our faculty think they need in terms of professional development, and that is very much reflected in the programming that's delivered the following year. Um, so you can see, uh, different than a Center for Teaching uh, and Learning, uh, this is much more focused on, on faculty development and faculty engagement. For example, uh, one of the things that we started was a faculty tailgate. It was called the faculty kegger for, for football. So it's not just professional development in terms of uh, uh, helping with faculty professional success, but also creating a sense of belonging and a sense of uh, community amongst our faculty. And probably the last part, again, going back to the uh, data-driven uh, and, and uh, evidence-based, is we track everything. We track uh, and the, uh, in terms of uh, our faculty engagement, physical engagement with our faculty cafe, uh, which faculty members are taking which types of experience. A lot of them are self-paced. Uh, they select in. There's no, this is not the teaching police for those faculty out there. This is, again, programming for faculty, developed by faculty, but with a set of clear outcomes and success measures. We all know what we're trying to achieve, and as a consequence, uh, our faculty don't see this as being intrusive. They see it as a positive, which I think is very important for the success of these types of programs. Uh, and as I said, we track everything, including the impact on research productivity and output and scholarship. Uh, and we've had some very positive uh, uh, effects of that. And faculty have responded by wanting to be part of these things. Another element uh, that we talked about, uh, or hopefully I've, I've made it clear, is that you also need to recognize and reward your faculty for their research and scholarship activities and their, uh, and their creative activities outside of the various. And we have a variety of programs. Uh, 
Um, uh, we had a program recently called the 50 and 5, which is a five-year program that has just ended. Uh, I'd like to point out Scholars Walk, which is a unique, uh, uh, which is these five, it's actually an art installation, and the art that's up there are, are the things that our faculty create, uh, including uh, awards and publications uh, and bios on some of our uh, more uh, prominent faculty members. Uh, we also have space scattered throughout the, uh, uh, the university uh, that becomes available for faculty members that, for example, are involved in innovation and startup formation. Uh, this is some very nice space uh, called the Innovation Center, again, part of, of the, uh, uh, the now UH Technology Bridge. Uh, and also we have a very, uh, I think, uh, comprehensive and uh, generous uh, faculty excellence awards program uh, that was actually funded by our Board of Regents uh, back about 10 years ago. So community engagement. I had uh, conversations, uh, how am I doing on time? Got 30 minutes? The left and then question? Okay, great, sorry. So I'm gonna move a little quicker, <laughs> sorry. <clears throat> but when it comes to community engagement, uh, I had some conversations yesterday with a variety of uh, communi uh, community engagement professionals. I am not a community engagement professional. I want everybody to understand that. But I've learned enough, uh, especially with APLU and CC, to be dangerous. Uh, so if anybody is an expert in the audience, please feel free to uh, comment later uh, or correct me or uh, set me straight in terms of uh, what we're about to see. This is a very busy slide. Uh, but the reason that I wanted to show it to the audience, and especially uh, with faculty members who are interested in actually becoming community engaged, uh, as well as the Discover 2025 element of essentially promoting community engagement as a way to move a day forward, is that we need to understand what community engagement actually is. Uh, and certainly as a faculty member that was involved in data collection in real world situations, I thought it was community engaged. Well, they're not. It's a continuum. Uh, and a lot of this has actually been informed uh, by the experience of, for example, the extension services at land grant universities. Uh, and I'm very interested in as part of my work as co-chair at CC this year, I'm, I'm uh, on a task force trying to figure out how Universities such as U of H, which are urban serving, or uh, other uh, uh, universities such as A-State that are not land grants can actually leverage the networks that are out there as part of the extension service. If you think about community engagement, the extension service is a great example of being embedded with the community for the community. But if you're, you're not on a land grant, or even if you're not involved with engagement, very few uh, uh, members of the, the campus community, especially faculty members, don't actually understand those things. So I think it's very important uh, to have a framework where everybody can understand. And more importantly, and the reason that I'm actually showing you this, is when I first saw it, I was like, there, uh, certainly from a faculty perspective, along this continuum of, of community engagement, which goes from the left from essentially just outreach, uh, all the way to co-creation, which is true, uh, uh, from my perspective, true uh, community engagement. That continuum relative to these uh, multiple boxes, uh, why I'm excited about this particular framework is that as a faculty member or as an academic administrator, you can see where you fit. Uh, you may not necessarily have experience uh, in any of the, in the verticals, the co-create, the collaborate, the involve, consult, or inform, but you do have full understanding of research, creative activities, teaching, instruction, and service. That's the lens that most faculty members are looking through. This continuum of outreach and engagement involves multiple things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And one of the, uh, if the goal is to uh, engage more members of the A-State community, especially our faculty members, in community engagement that ends up in a positive place, then we all need to know where our place is in it and where we can bring the most uh, to that community engagement mission. Uh, I have seen personally, uh, as an associate provost, being, being uh, uh, contacted by community members going, do you know this faculty member? Yes. 
uh, well, can you tell them to cease and desist? It's like, why? What, what is going on out there? Well, it turns out this faculty member had a great idea. It was a wonderful idea. Goes out, starts uh, talking to community members, and doesn't realize that there has been a pre-existing relationship with that particular community group with a different faculty member or a different center on campus, uh, and it has caused lots of friction. And a lot of work that has been laid down in the past gets disrupted because, simply because our faculty member, who did have a great idea, in the end didn't realize that he needed to figure out where he was in this matrix and whether there were other people in that space. Because then you can leverage those pre-existing uh, networks, those pre-existing relationships, uh, and end up with a better outcome. Rather than trying to reinvent the wheel or in fact, you know, create a completely new car. Now this particular framework, I'm not gonna take any uh, ownership on. Uh, this is adapted from the International Association of Public Participation, or IP2. Uh, and actually, where this came from was from co some colleagues at Colorado State University uh, in their extension and, and engagement office. Uh, and as part of uh, uh, this, my role with CC as co-chair, we're trying to develop this as one of a best practice model that we can then uh, actually distribute to other APLU members as a way to think uh, about community engagement as this overall holistic type of engagement model uh, rather than very discrete elements that everybody decides to stay in their own little silo. Uh, so again, that being my sort of overall view of what community engagement is, how do we get here? Uh, to those goals that are in the Discover 2025 for a state. So <clears throat> I'm uh, looking through uh, your, your information. I know we have a Center for Community Engagement. In fact, I talked to some of our, uh, uh, your colleagues yesterday about that. Uh, I know after those discussions, they have lots of pre-existing relationships and existing networks. Uh, do, does everybody know about those? That's a question that uh, always comes up. Uh, it's amazing what you actually learn just sitting and having a cup of coffee or you know, a cold beverage with one of your colleagues. Uh, and you're like, really? You guys are doing that? That's one of the things that always amazes me about a university is that there are so many different things going on and we do spend a lot of time doing but very little time telling. And one of the ways that we can tell is to have a formal structure to capture that information so that everybody has access to it and can actually understand where and how they can interact within that, within that engagement model. So again, you already have that process or the, those structures here at U of H, so you would build on those existing networks and relationships. Uh, personally, I'm a big fan of uh, uh, what's called the uh, innova innovation and Economic Prosperity University designation from APLU. I will say part of that is I helped to write the actual framework, uh, which is the Talent Innovation in Place framework. Again, all of this you can find on APLU's uh, uh, Commission on Economic and Community Engagement element. Uh, there are uh, publications around this TIP uh, framework. The TIP framework is sort of uh, uh, um, been incorporated into a couple of different APLU initiatives over the last 10 years. Uh, and that framework is all about recognizing the fact that a university is a unique um, ecosystem that stewards all three elements of talent, innovation, and place. Talent can be our students, it can be our faculty members, our staff members. Uh, the innovation element is by uh, part of our mission to generate new uh, knowledge and to, to transfer that knowledge. And then the place. All you got to do is walk outside the building and look at the campus. We have, uh, the A State campus covers a large area, very important to the surrounding community. So it's this TIP framework, Talent, Innovation, and in Place, uh, through the IEP designation. Um, part and parcel of what that in involves is a campus wide inventory. Uh, of uh, community engagement and economic engagement assets. And this is a process that I personally have gone through two times at U of H. Every time I've done it, it amazes me what's out there because even though I'm pretty plugged in across the campus, certainly on the faculty side and certainly on the innovation side, things change so quickly that if you're not looking for six months, all of a sudden there's something new out there. 
and you need to keep that up to date and you need to have internal access for all stakeholders and you need to actually have access from the external stakeholders so they know who to talk to if they want to become involved with a state. So it's a bilateral uh, uh, approach. But in terms of, of uh, sort of operationalizing and executing that type of strategy, the two things that I would suggest that a state consider doing, and I know that the first one, the Carnegie Foundation for Community Engagement designation, that's uh, it's already part of your Discover 2025. Uh, at APLU and specifically through SICEP, we actually recommend those institutions seeking an IEP designation to do the uh, Carnegie Foundation community engagement at the same time because the actual resources and um, process of self-study is essentially very similar except the difference is that one's focused on the economic impact and the other one's focused on the community engagement impact. So I would say uh, continue with uh, seeking the uh, uh, Carnegie Foundation for Community Engagement designation, but also seeking the IEP designation from APLU. So finally, the final goal, and I'm, I will be quick, <laughs> uh, is around campus culture and shared values. And some of the things that I'm going to say here, everybody in this room knows these things. The key is, are they executed and are they executed well? Uh, the first is uh, improving campus culture through students, social interaction and volunteerism. Those are things that build a sense of community here on campus uh, and a positive campus culture and that requires encouraging students to do that and that can be through a variety of clubs, a variety of uh, uh, joint projects, they can be formal or informal, co-curricular or not. Um, I hear you have a great rugby club here, actually, which is thought of very well. I'm an ex-rugby player, so I was very interested to hear that. <laughs> uh, but rugby players are great ambassadors for any institution. So that's just a plug for those guys who held up their boots. Um, I think what is truly required uh, to build a campus culture and a set of shared values is that you have to encourage and accept uh, and foster open and honest communication so that students, faculty, and staff are comfortable sharing their opinions and ideas. Uh, unless you're hearing, uh, as an administration, if you're not hearing what's actually going badly out there uh, and you're not listening, that's not a good place to be. Uh, and it certainly adds to a sense uh, that, uh, of a lack of sense of belonging here at A-State. Uh, and that's the same for every university. It, it is a, a common problem, certainly when we face at U of H, especially after COVID. Uh, we built uh, a, essentially a residential campus over the last 15 years. Uh, we went from something like 2,000 students actually living on campus to now more than 11,000 students living on campus and in some surrounding P3s uh, housing. Uh, COVID cam they lost that sense of cohesion and identity associated with being a cougar. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm very aware of this. Both my sons actually graduated. Uh, the first one graduated from U of H. The second one, he dropped out, but he's on his way back <laughs> to U of H. But, so understanding that side of, of U of H as a parent uh, uh, and somebody that was paying for their education along the way uh, um, was very useful in terms of understanding some of these, these issues that we're talking about. I think it's also uh, important to embrace diversity, celebrate different cultures, and to promote inclusivity and belonging in order to change that culture. And that can be done in many different ways. And uh, even though, let's say, some of the political climate is very challenging to do that in a very front-facing and proactive fashion, there are many things that you can do that achieve the same uh, while being authentic about what you're doing. And then finally, I think this is something that we've, we've seen, all of, we've all seen, which is the, to ensure that there are adequate mental health resources and wellness programs, not just for our students, but also for our faculty and staff. Certainly on the faculty side at U of H, uh, we've had many more uh, faculty members and uh, professional academic staff have some, some issues that come from uh, a very grinding schedule over the last couple of years. 
as well as having to deal with many more students that come to them for advice and mentorship with their issues. So I think those are things that need to be priorities for the overall health and, and wellness of the campus it, itself. Uh, in terms of potential action items, the, this comes from uh, uh, personal experience uh, around DEI and belonging initiatives, is that you need a clear value proposition for why the institution uh, and, and the campus community uh, fost should foster a physical, intellectual, and cultural diversity. And that has to be based on enhancing student success outcomes. If you have role models for uh, uh, our, our students, uh, if you have a clear uh, commitment to that, uh, you can then track it in terms of student success. And student success uh, should be the number one priority for any institution uh, that has students and, and that their academic and research mission is about, uh, in some way, impacting those student success measures. I think it's also very uh, important to, have, uh, to ensure clear policies and procedures to address and prevent discrimination. I asked that question today. I, it appears that we already have those types of things here at A State. Uh, and then something I heard yesterday uh, from students and, and, and took to heart because it's something that we deal with and have dealt with at U of H, and I believe I spelt that wrong, uh, is to develop communication pathways with students that are authentic and personalized. Uh, emails, as you know, students don't read emails in general. Um, and as a consequence, uh, for example, at U of H, we use a texting tool within our Navigate. Uh, we have a UH app that we can connect directly with students. They're all personalizable, so it comes with their name. Uh, uh, and um, it's authentic in terms of who writes it. You know, it's not, you know, Associate Provost Clark in academic speak. It's, it's our, our student engagement professionals who write all of that stuff. And then finally, ensuring that the university remains an employer of choice. And when I say employer in choice, is that our faculty want to stay here, our staff want to be part of supporting students and, and faculty here on campus. And I'm sure that A State has faced the same, uh, let's say, challenges with uh, retaining and hiring new staff and new faculty that all universities have. Uh, so in terms of the overall framework of how we deal with our employees, those being faculty and staff, is that they need to be employers of choice. So just some parting thoughts, and then I'm going to open it for questions. Uh, all stakeholders must share the same. In order to be uh, successful, especially in meeting the Discover 2025 goals, is that all stakeholders that are involved in that process and stakeholders are students, faculty, staff, alumni, uh, community partners, industry partners. They must share the same core values and long-term vision for the future of the university. And this requires ongoing constructive dialogue. And that, hopefully that dialogue, and I think it is reflected in the Discover 2025 plan, uh, is that that leads to a common vision, and more importantly, a set of mutually agreed upon goals and success measures that actually uh, are associated with those. And everybody has to agree on what's fair, equitable, and uh, um, before you actually embark on the journey. <clears throat> so with that, in order to get there, uh, and this, as I, I, I've had a lot of experience along the way, both as a faculty member and as faculty senate president and multiple uh, administrative uh, elements, that those groups, those stakeholder groups that come together that requires compromise, flexibility, and a willingness to listen to new ideas uh, and different types of approaches that truly and honestly, which is what this is all about, upsets the status quo. That by definition is all about change and change management. But in order to have a constructive and hopefully successful uh, uh, not only conversation but implementation of those things, uh, you do need to have that ongoing constructive dialogue. Some of the things that are required for this to work, uh, and again, from personal experience, open, timely, and transparent communication is essential. If, you, if there's a vacuum, somebody will make up a different story. The narrative changes, and it can change very quickly and very negatively if there isn't this open, timely, and transparent communication. And that's from both sides. 
Uh, and I, and I, I don't like using the word side. I did not move to the dark side when I became an administrator. I'm still a faculty member. Still love getting my lab, not that I do. I graduated my last graduate student about two years ago. But I don't see myself as Darth Vader. Okay? <clears throat> and then finally, that, uh, as part of that, trust, mutual respect, and accountability is essential to that overall process. That's where you want to end up, uh, is that all of the stakeholders trust, respect each other, and they know that each of them will hold themselves as well as everybody else accountable across the university. Uh, and I think uh, if you end up there, uh, then, then the future is very bright at A-State. Um, the other element of that, uh, I think, uh, is that those relationships and, and reaching there, needs, that needs to occur in the good times. Uh, that's one of the things that I can honestly and candidly say to you, without having that type of trust, mutual respect and accountability between our faculty and staff and our administration at U of H during COVID, it would have been a complete disaster. But as a consequence, lots of shared governance groups actually stepped up and within a matter of 60 days, we were ready to go uh, in terms of uh, maintaining our services to our students. And my final parting comment is, the price of success is always paid up front. Take that for what you will. Okay guys, uh, thank you for listening, thank you for being here, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Oh, I'm sorry, I talked a lot. I apologize. Good morning. Good morning, Rebecca Oliver, Director of the Honors College. What do you see as the value of an Honors College or an Honors Program in an institution of higher education? So I think uh, the value of an Honors Education uh, in some ways is, is self-evident. Uh, in terms of, but in terms of serving students, there are always going to be those students that need and deserve uh, an enriched curriculum. Uh, and having an honors college, and again, not knowing exactly, uh, uh, not having had time to spend looking at the honors uh, curriculum, uh, I think it's probably very similar to, to uh, U of H. Uh, it is also a place that you can experiment uh, with different types of approaches that then can then be scaled to all students. Uh, you know, it's not uncommon in Honors College, and certainly are as Honors College, to have lots of volunteer organizations that are truly community engagement uh, and engagement with various elements, including uh, our pre-health pathways, those types of things. Uh, but that allows us to test it out and see whether it's scalable and whether it would work. So I think there's, a, there's always a place for an honors college and an, uh, and an honors curriculum. The key is, of course, how do you implement it uh, and what's an equitable uh, resource allocation associated with it. Did I answer your question, Rebecca? Okay. Good to see you again. So certainly in a comprehensive university, our uh, arts and humanities are as important to the overall experience that a student uh, has during their time at a university. Uh, I am aware of some of the heritage sites and the like. I see those as opportunities uh, for experiential learning for students that are in those programs. Uh, I would also say that uh, while my examples, because they're my own personal examples, as part of the Fed and as part of U of H's approach, we actually have programs that are tailored towards our arts and humanities because they are usually not areas that receive large amounts of external dollars. There are some uh, obvious exceptions, certainly at U of H and I'm sure at A-State, uh, 
uh, where it, 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 you do have a, uh, a external funding for those programs. But in general, they're usually small amounts needed to actually create a large impact, and it's about scholarship and creative activity. Uh, so our internal seed grants, for example, are split. You're, they, some of them are reserved specifically for our arts and humanities faculty members and for those programs that are uh, not associated with our STEM and our business side. Uh, so um, this is an oversight I could have actually shown. In fact, I, uh, for example, the SURE program, which is a business program, that includes law students, communication students, uh, um, our creative writers, because those skill sets are essential, for example, in marketing. So when people say that the English degree is dead, I disagree with completely. In fact, I have some, some colleagues that, that uh, end up in the corporate world because of their ability to communicate in the way that they do in a very effective manner and to be able to uh, present and to interact with people uh, around that sort of cross-cultural uh, uh, comparative type approach makes them very marketable. In fact, I think our arts and humanities uh, departments and colleges don't make use enough of that. You need to be able to market those skill sets because they're extremely valuable. But saying that, you know, uh, we're not recognized for it, you need to be at their front because every student in STEM and in, in business, for example, needs to pass English. They need to be able to communicate. That's what you guys do at best. So I would say, uh, again, uh, that was my oversight in terms of uh, not using specific examples, but that's my personal opinion of where the arts and humanities are. It is a comprehensive university. We're not a research university. Certainly U of H is not, A, a State is not. Any other questions? Unfortunately, schedule says okay. we can't take any more, but <laughs> join me in thanking Dr. Carr. Again, a reminder, in tomorrow's digest, you'll get the link again for comments and feedback on each of our candidates. And next week, we'll be here on Tuesday. I know the previous ones have been Wednesday. Tuesday at 9 o'clock for our next candidate. Thank you all.